Committee will be in order. Jeff, can you hear okay there? Our uh, first order of business today is to uh, revise the committee's 302Bs for uh, several subcommittees in order to comply with the overall discretionary top line allocation provided in the uh, budget resolution. We need to do this because of the way the budget resolution was structured besides the regular funding that we allocated earlier this year. The budget resolution also included additional funding for the global war on terrorism, but this funding only becomes available when this committee reports out the bills that fund these overseas contingencies. Since we're moving forward on the defense bill today as the next order of business, uh, which incorporates $118.7 billion in funding for the global war on terrorism, we need to revise our current 302Bs today to reflect this additional funding. This adjustment for the Defense Subcommittee represents by far the lion's share of the reallocation here today. These resources are to fund our military operations as well as to support our men and women overseas in Iraq, Afghanistan, and elsewhere who are in the field fighting against uh, terrorism. Budget Committee is in agreement with uh, this number and will revise its overall allocation accordingly later today. This will allow the defense bill to move forward for the House floor consideration. In addition, we're adjusting outlays among subcommittees to reflect CBO scoring of bills that have been reported from a committee or passed the House. These adjustments reallocate outlays from uh, those subcommittees which are below their current outlay allocation to subcommittees uh, where there is an outlay imbalance, including agriculture and labor age. We need to approve these revised allocations in order to continue to bring the bills to the House floor in full compliance with the overall spending level provided in the budget resolution. I ask for support of this motion, and I yield to Mr. Dix for any remarks he cares to make. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the revisions of the 302 BA allocation first provide additional BA for the Defense Subcommittee to fund the global war on terror as requested by the President. In addition, the revisions take from the Defense Subcommittee about $1.3 billion in outlays and nearly $200 million in outlays from Homeland in order to plus up labor, HHS, and education by over $1 billion and plus up agriculture by $500 million in outlays. Democrats in the committee continue to strongly disagree with the underlying allocation. It is unrealistic and ignores common sense economics. The cuts required in the Ryan budget far exceed discretionary cuts recommended by the Bowles Simpson <coughs> Deficit Reduction Commission and the Dominici Rivlin Commission. Both commissions warned Congress not to cut so abruptly as to imperil the fragile economic recovery. The underlying allocations ignore that sensible advice and would impede, not encourage, economic growth and job creation. <coughs> subcommittee by subcommittee, the underlying allocations prevent the committee from undertaking critical investments and growth in America's future. But we are not here today to relitigate the underlying allocations. The revisions before us this morning are reasonable and we have no objection. Is there further discussion? Are there amendments? If not, uh, I yield to Mr. Young for a motion. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I move that the committee approve the report on the revised 302B allocation. You heard the motion. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, nay. No. Ayes have it, and the motion is agreed to. Next order of business is the Defense Appropriations Bill. I, we're pleased to uh, yield to the distinguished subcommittee chairman, the chairman emeritus of the committee. The gentleman from Florida, Mr. Young, to present the bill. Well, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. And I know Mr. Dix will join me in saying it is really good that we're finally getting a defense bill before the Appropriations Committee, because he tried last year really hard and it just didn't happen. So that makes it one good thing makes it today. It, it is uh, proper that today is the 236th anniversary of the birth of the United States Army. And so I say we give the Army a round of applause. Uh, 
our army may not, the, may not be the biggest army in the world, but it's by far the best. And all of you have helped make that possible over the years as we provide what the warfighter needs in training and equipment, and we continue to do that very thing. Mr. Chairman, the fiscal year 2012 Department of Defense base budget recommend recommendation today is $530 billion. But when you add to it the overseas contingency operation, the I war in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, you're right, it, the total is $649 billion, uh, and it is above the, uh, the initial request. But this is uh, mostly attributable to the transfer of the Pakistan Counterinsurgency Fund from the State Department operations to the Defense Subcommittee. So we finally had to, we had to, uh, had to cough up the money. To reach the reduced base allocation of $530 billion, that is basically $9 billion less than the President requested. But we reviewed in detail the budget request and found areas and programs where reductions are possible without adversely affecting the warfighter or readiness. Now, just give me, a, I'll just give you a couple of examples, and I'm not going to bore you with a lot of detail, because we have provided you about three different very detailed uh, papers in writing explaining what is in this bill and what's in the report. So I'm not, b believe me, I'm not going to go into $530 billion worth of money. But we were very careful that we, we uh, took funding from programs that have been terminated or restructured since the budget was submitted. Savings from favorable contract pricing adjustments, contract and schedule delays resulting in 2000 and FY 2012 savings, unjustified cost increases or funding requested ahead of need, anticipated or historical under execution and rescissions of unneeded prior year funds, and reductions that are authorized in the House-passed National Defense Authorization Act, which passed the House with 322 votes. Now, just briefly, some of the details of the subcommittee's recommendation is $15.1 billion for the construction of 10 Navy ships, $5.9 billion for 32 Joint Strike Fighter aircraft, $3 billion for F-18 Super Hornets and, and, and 12 EA-18 Growlers, $2.8 billion for 16 H-60 Black Hawk helicopters. Uh, we have a little uh, dispute with the de Defense Department on the question of unrealistic operation and maintenance efficiencies. Uh, we, 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 change, we, we agree with that there are some operation and maintenance efficiencies, but we're not sure that as much as the Defense Department said. We have $1.5 billion for National Guard and Reserve Equipment, $610 million for service-identified uh, service unfunded requirements, including $239 million for SOCOM, uh, which help, uh, will help pay for operations like the one that got bin Laden. And then $633 million for military medical research, which is really important. And we may talk about that a little, little more later uh, during the amendment process, but for anyone who has ever visited at Walter Reed or at Bethesda Navy Hospital and see what is happening to our young men uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan, and still in Iraq, it's not just Afghanistan, uh, there are serious, serious medical problems. So we, we need the research, we need the medical care, and one of the big issues uh, that we were learning more and more about is uh, psychological health, traumatic brain injury. So th there's a lot going on there. Well, there's a lot more about this bill. Uh, Mr. Dix and I spent a long time, uh, along with other members of the subcommittee, uh, going through this line by line. And uh, believe it or not, I think I read this bill three times. And my staff said, nobody ever reads the bill. Well, I read it, but uh, there's so much detail in it. Mr. Dix, when he was chairman last year, he allowed us to be totally involved in the bill that we prepared. This year, Mr. Dix has been totally involved uh, in the bill that we present today. And uh, I would, uh, I think I'll just stop my comments at this point because we, we're hoping to get finished before we have to start voting uh, early this afternoon. So I'll yield back, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Dix. <coughs> uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. It has once again been an honor to work with my friend, the chairman of the subcommittee, Bill Young, 
to prepare the defense appropriations bill for fiscal year 2012. In the longstanding tradition of this committee, the bill has been prepared on a bipartisan basis, and I strongly support the bill. In writing this bill, the committee had to make hard choices. As you know, the allocation for this year is $530 billion, $9 billion below the request. While this is $17 billion above the fiscal year 11 enacted level, much of the increase is absorbed by the military pay, operation and maintenance, defense health program accounts. In addition, the committee had to tread very carefully in evaluating funding increases because of the policy not to fund earmarks in fiscal year 2012. <laughs> Nevertheless, the bill uh, before the committee provides the funding essential to maintain readiness and quality of life for U.S. service personnel and invest in the technologies required to meet future threats to U.S. security. The bill provides $118.7 billion for operations in Afghanistan and for the continuing withdrawal of U.S. forces from Iraq. The bill ensures that troops have essential force protection and provides the means for the Afghans to provide their own security. The bill includes $3.2 billion to continue fielding MRAPs and $12.8 billion to train Afghan national security forces. Uh, the bill also addresses many of DOD's most pressing investment needs. It funds 10 ships, as requested in the budget, and 32 Joint Strike Fighters. Now, many of us on the committee feel that the Joint Strike Fighter program has turned the corner and is now moving in a much stronger direction. And uh, I hope that as the process continues, we can get this thing off of probation. I think with Mr. Gates <coughs> leaves, that probably is possible. And uh, I hope he would do it before he leaves. Uh, also, there's a, a M1A2 system enhancement package. $272 million is included to prevent a break in production of tanks. And I just want to say to the committee, the worst thing we could do is shut down this line. We got Because we're going to reopen it in two or three years. So we need to bridge this gap, keep the industrial base in place. It's a smart investment by the committee. The Humvee Force Protection, $50 million. Long Range Strike, $100 million. Special Operation Command, as we're so proud of the uh, SOCOM for their work in capturing and, and just uh, killing Osama bin Laden, $250 million. <coughs> Nagria, money for the Guard and Reserves, so that they can get some acquisition on their own, $1.5 billion. Intelligence, Surveillance, and Reconnaissance, $50 million. SBIR, Small Business Independent Research, $50 million. Black, historically black colleges and universities, 20 million energy efficiency. Everything, this has been, a, is a very good bill. We have also addressed cybersecurity. I believe cybersecurity and vulnerability is one of the most important issues that we face. I believe the NSA and the Defense Department are doing a good job. We've got to work closer with Department of Homeland Security to make sure they're doing their part on the rest of the government outside of the military the civil, s civil side, and also with the private sector. And I'll just say one thing. You know, I have supported uh, the President's initiatives in Iraq and Afghanistan, but I am increasingly, as I see the priorities that we're having to deal with here in this Appropriations Committee, I'm increasingly convinced that the administration has to uh, accelerate the withdrawal of U.S. forces from Afghanistan and at the same time uh, work for a political settlement. And I just believe trying to fund $113 billion in 12, 13, and 14 is not going to be realistic. And so I think this is a, it's a question of my mind of are we going to educate the American people? Are we going to take care of the people who are unemployed? Or are we going to continue to do nation building in Afghanistan? I think that's a choice we're all going to have to consider in the days ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The chair recognizes himself. Uh, I want to thank uh, Bill Young and Norm Dix for their commitment to putting out a bipartisan defense bill that uh, supports the troops and addresses our critical national security needs. The $530 billion in non-emergency funding uh, in this bill will provide our armed forces with the resources they need and will allow for the advancement of our nation's missions 
and the protection of our people here at home. As our soldiers and Marines continue to uh, put their lives on the line to eliminate terrorism and protect freedom around the globe, Congress must support and fund their actions in a timely and reasonable manner. This bill sustains our military readiness, facilitating the continued modernization and preservation of the greatest armed forces in the world. These efforts include adequate funding for equipment procurement, base operations, and military pay. To improve our defense capabilities and prepare for future challenges, we've provided funding for the research and development of new technology, including the tanker replacement program and the broad area maritime surveillance unmanned aerial vehicle. This legislation also provides essential funding for health and quality of life programs for the men and women of the armed forces and their families. Although we are engaged in wars on several fronts, there's also a battle being waged at home against skyrocketing dangerous deficits. No bill or department should be immune from scrutiny during these difficult financial times. This legislation identifies fiscally responsible savings, savings that will in no way impair the safety of our troops, the success of our military missions, or our, our military readiness. The bill also rescinds $1.7 billion in unneeded prior year funds where appropriate. The bill also increases oversight of defense programs and funds to ensure that tax dollars are being spent wisely and efficiently. We've taken a critical eye and increased scrutiny on some programs to ensure American taxpayers are receiving the proper benefits for these defense investments. For instance, we've provided for the Pakistan Counterinsurgency Capability Fund, but the bill withholds 75 percent of that funding until the Secretary provides Congress with a report on strategy and metrics for the use of those dollars, particularly in light of recent developments in that country. All in all, this bill is $9 billion less than the President's request. However, the uh, legislation increases base funding for defense by $17 billion, reflecting our steadfast commitment to ensuring our troops and commanders have the resources they need. Once again, I want to thank uh, Chairman Young and Ranking Member Dix for their hard work on this bill, uh, a truly bipartisan bill, and I urge the committee uh, to uh, promptly report the bill to the House. <coughs> now, is there further discussion? Hearing none, are there amendments? Mr. Mr. Dix. I have an amendment at the desk. Clerk will report. Amendment offered by Mr. Dix inserted in the appropriate place the following. The committee is deeply concerned about the prospect of human rights abuses in connection with continuing operations in and around P Afghanistan, Pakistan, and elsewhere in connection with Operation Enduring Freedom. Accordingly, the committee reminds the Department of Defense of the applicability of Section 8058 of this bill to funds made available in Title IX to include funds made available for coalition support and funds made available through the Pakistan Counterinsurgency Fund. The committee directs that the Secretary of Defense provide a report to the Congressional Defense Committees within 60 days of enactment of this act and on a quarterly basis thereafter on any suspected incidents of human rights abuses. The report may be submitted in classified form if necessary. Um, I would just say that I have uh, We've been following this very closely with the chair chairman and others in the uh, Congress. This is a serious issue. Uh, we want to make sure that the funds we're using and using to equip and train the uh, Pakistanis uh, are not going to units that have been engaged in, in human rights abuses. And uh, I urge the committee to ex adopt the amendment. The gentleman yield? Yes, I yield to the chairman. Thank the gentleman for yielding. And this is report language. And it clarifies bill language that is already in the bill, and we obviously accept this report language and uh, thank the gentleman for offering it. Thank you. Is there discussion? Hearing none. All in favor of the amendments, say aye. 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 All opposed, nay. Motion is agreed to.
Amendments to be approved. Are there amendments? Mr. Wolf. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. Clerk will read. Ask unanimous amendment ask offered by Mr. Wolf. The reading is waived. Uh, several years ago, during the Iraq War, this committee passed an amendment to set up the, Af the Iraq Study Group. It became the Baker Ham Hamilton uh, Commission. Uh, today, I'm offering an amendment to set up a similar uh, setup called the Afghanistan Pakistan Study Group to take 90 days, bipartisan. I've talked to John Hamry at the CSIS. The Defense Department would set this up, but five Republicans, five Democrats, similar to what we had on the Baker Hamilton Commission, to look at everything and report back to the Congress and to, to the country. In support of this, uh, and now I can, uh, Ryan Crocker, who I spoke to before he was appointed am, am ambassador, so I'm making that clear, it was before, agreed with this, thought it was a good idea. Jim Dobbins of Rand said he favored this concept. David Abshar, the Center for the Study of the Presidents, who were passing that letter, supports this concept. Ron Newman, who was our ambassador uh, to Afghanistan, su supports it. It's basically fresh eyes on the target. I think we owe it to the men and women who are serving there to make sure we're looking at this in the most comprehensive a way that we, uh, that we, <coughs> that we possibly can. We've all been to uh, the funerals. We've all been out to Walter Reed. The first person killed in Afghanistan was from my congressional district. In fact, Robert Adholt was at the funeral. Uh, Michael, Michael Spahn, Manassas Park, uh, killed, killed there the very, very first. Uh, I have a letter from a mom uh, in uh, Warrington. I won't read the whole letter, but we're going to pass it out. She says, uh, Dear Mr. Wolf, I've read your proposal for the formation of the Afghanistan-Pakistan study group with deep personal interest, and she has five kids, all who are serving or who have served in the military in Iraq and Afghanistan. I applaud its respectful, well-reasoned, bipartisan approach to rethinking the war in Afghanistan. The following are my personal thoughts regarding this war. Please accept them uh, as the insights of an average American mother. And then it goes on, but I'll only read the one last paragraph. It has sometimes appeared that the efforts in Afghanistan have trudged along with success measured in part by areas in which we have gained some measure of control versus the price paid in human life, both civilian and military. The casualties suffered aren't just numbers to me, each name each face represents a family who is paying the ultimate price, the loss of a son or a daughter, brother or sister, father or mother, a family that will never be the same. Therefore, I wholeheartedly support the formation of the Afghanistan-Pakistan study group in the hope that it will help turn the tide in this war <coughs> and lessen the number of casualties. We have caught and killed bin Laden. Everyone who knows about this believes that you cannot be successful without also looking at Pakistan. Some of the best minds that I've spoken to have said this is a good idea. So I respectfully offer this for this committee to adopt this amendment. They will be on a 90-day approach, report back uh, to the Congress and to the administration. But it is fresh eyes, and we need fresh eyes. And with that, I'll just urge uh, uh, support of the amendment. Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Wolf was kind enough to talk with me a number of times in the last few weeks about this. And we do not have any uh, opposition to what he wants to do. Uh, and we're not going to oppose this amendment. But I would say this. It really does not belong on an appropriations bill. It's really an authorizing issue. And uh, it would have been a good idea to also take this up with the authorizers when they passed the NDAA. Uh, last week, but anyway, uh, we do not. We just we agree with the uh, purpose of this. <coughs> we just don't think this is the right vehicle. But we're not going to oppose the amendment. Uh, well, I certainly agree with uh, Mr. Wolf's approach. I think uh, uh, we've used this ta th this approach in the in previous history. Uh, I agree. I think there we need to have a complete look at our policy, both as it relates to Pakistan and Afghanistan, but also to the entire region. So I hope that uh, the gentleman's amendment will be adopted and that we can that it will be useful and helpful to the Congress and to the American people, and also to the to the military people who are serving. Who, when Secretary Gates was recently there, 
the one question they kept asking him, what does the, the, you know, the taking out of Osama bin Laden mean for the war? I mean, the, the troops are concerned uh, after 10 years, and, and they have every right to be. Thank you. Let's accept the amendment. Just to underscore the bipartisan nature of the amendment, uh, uh, Mr. Wolf's effort with the Iraq Study Group was a constructive input into the debate. Uh, no one, even those most uh, ardently opposed to the war, can believe that it's going to end in 90 days. This is going to be uh, a very useful complement to the debate. I think it's appropriate, and I appreciate uh, Mr. Wolf taking the initiative and introducing it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be brief. As a member of the Defense Subcommittee, I, too, want to stand in support of Mr. Wolf's amendment. And uh, I have supported uh, uh, the surge in Afghanistan. I have supported uh, all the President's actions and uh, do believe that there is a, a very important mission for our forces in Afghanistan. Having said that, uh, the costs, as Mr. Dix uh, described, are grave, uh, not only to our war fighters but to our economy. And I think uh, Mr. Wolf's uh, amendment is timely and important, and I urge my colleagues to uh, accept it. Uh, I, I concur with what's been said about the, uh, the efforts of uh, my colleague, Mr. Wolf, and uh, I think it's time for us to, to leave Afghanistan and to bring our young people home, but I think this study group would be an important part of making sure that uh, we have uh, input from uh, all corners, and I want to commend the gentleman from Virginia. Thank you. If I have the right copy, you've spoken of 90 days. The copy that I have says 120 days. I don't see a definition of this as the Afghanistan-Pakistan study group in the amendment that I have a copy of. Have I, did you present a, a different version? No, it, it's the one you just read. Yeah. Under the rules of the House. My. Under the rules of the House, we can no longer have earmarks. I was the author of the, of the Iraq study group. That was an earmark. It was a million dollars. Uh, I went uh, to Iraq and saw things that I felt that I just, and so we have worded this in such a way that complies with the rules of the House. The Department of Defense would be the ultimate decider as to where, who, what outside group. I have used that as an example because I cannot put in under the rules of the House I cannot specify under the rules that John Hamry from CSIS would do it. And so because of that, we have worded it to comply with, with, with the rules of the House. But I'm sure that if this committee acts, uh, I hope the full Congress would. I have trust that, the, that uh, the Department of Defense would follow through in the spirit. So I've used the Iraq study group as an example, but in light of where we are with regard to the earmark, it was does not designate it because we cannot. So, so you cannot, you cannot designate the name uh, Pakistan and Afghanistan Study Group in the amendment, and it is you, you've mentioned 90 days. I'm still puzzled. The the copy that I have says 120 days. 120 days is what it in. I think it could actually be done in 90 days, but the language uh, 120 days. But we have I not <coughs> narrowed it down to the name because under the rules we operate, we cannot. Thank you. Uh, neither. If the gentleman would yield, to be on the lines of the Baker Ham Hamilton Commission, named after Jim Baker and Lee Ham Hamilton, where they got five Republicans, five Democrats, men and women who had great expertise, uh, some of political views, but came together. They looked at everything. They also went to Iraq and came back with a report. Uh, in it, uh, many people believe it was a defining moment whereby the Bush administration made, was able to change some things. So the model that it would be and we've made it as clear as we can under the rules of the House, would be the Iraq study group, the so-called Baker-Hamilton Commission, and not the other two that you referenced. Any further discussion? Uh, Chairman Wolf, would you
two responses to your question. Uh, this this language is rather <coughs> explicit authorization language. Uh, have you had a chance to confer with the authorizing committee about this? Uh, I have I have not. Uh, I would just say to, in answer to that, the Iraq study group, what's most people in the Congress favored, came out of this committee and came out of uh, the subcommittee that I was than the chairman of, so there, there is precedent. It is an opportunity, it is, it is an avenue, and when I talk to these young men and women that are served, I don't know the answer. I, I can't tell you that I know what we should do, <laughs> but uh, in light of where <coughs> we are, and I try to work this through now, we do have to support uh, Duncan, Duncan Hunter, uh, Congressman Hunter, who served in Afghanistan, is a co-sponsor of of the, of the bill, young Duncan Hunter, the, a son of uh, former chairman Duncan, Duncan Hunter. Uh, but the members of the authorizing committee are on it, but we're using the same precedent, precedent and process that we use for if, as If I'm not mistaken, the original language for the Iraq study group, as this apparently was modeled after. Yes, sir. Uh, was referred to the Foreign Affairs Committee. Is that uh, correct? No, sir. It was uh, my uh, my uh, my amendment in uh, in the Foreign Operations Committee in this subcommittee. I was chairman, <coughs> if you recall, Mr. Uh, Lewis, who was then State Justice right. for Foreign Operations, uh, because God bless uh, <coughs> Jerry Lewis, he allowed the Foreign Operations to stay there during that last term, and I've always been very obligated. We then put it on there because I saw things were not. I would talk to the administration and I would go down and literally frustrate it. No one would <coughs> pay any attention. And finally, to President Bush's credit, they accepted this and they thought maybe it was a positive thing. And later, yeah, we'll tell you, Secretary Rice <laughs> thought it was a positive thing. But I had such a difficult time getting anyone to focus. And uh, uh, so, but this is the same uh, process that we, that we use for the Iraq study group. And it's nothing more, I don't know the answer, I can't tell them it would have to be, it will not be credible unless it is bipartisan and men and women, and I was criticized for saying this, but I'm gonna say it again, men and women who love their country more than they love their political party to speak <coughs> truth and say and give us fresh eyes on the target. We owe it to the men and women and their families that are serving there. Well, the only reservation the chair has is about the authorization language uh, but if the gentleman is, is able to withstand that, then uh, I think this would be a good, a good report. Uh, any further discussion? I thank the chair. Any further discussion? Mr. Wolf, you're recognized if you desire for a minute. No, I have nothing else. Sir. You've heard the uh, discussion. All in favor of the amendment say aye. 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 Opposed nay. And the, the amendment is agreed to. Uh, further amendments? Gentlelady from Ohio. Yes, thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I have an amendment on report language at the desk. <coughs> Clerk will report. Amendment offered by Ms. Kaptur. At the appropriate place in the report, insert, the committee is deeply concerned about I the rate of unemployment facing service objection, personnel. Is dispensed with. Um, Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you very much for your openness on this, and I will just spend less than a minute reading the three sentences of this report language to my colleagues. And it concerns an Iraq and Afghanistan veterans unemployment report. The committee is deeply concerned about the rate of unemployment facing service personnel who have returned from the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan nationwide. 873,000 <coughs> veterans are unemployed. And amongst post 9-11 veterans, the unemployment rate is 10.9% or 214,000 post 9-11 veterans. Among those veterans post 9-11 who are 18 to 24 years of age, they suffer the highest unemployment rate of any veteran group, 26.8% with 50,000 unemployed. Not later than 60 days after the enactment of this act, the Secretary of Defense <coughs> in coordination with the Secretary of Veterans Affairs is directed to submit a report in writing to the Congressional <coughs> Defense Committees on recommendations for programmatic, regulatory, 
legislative and administrative actions that can be taken to address this national crisis. And though it is not in the language, I don't think it's any secret about the rising suicide rates among our veterans, many of those related directly to their inability to get employment when they come home. And I thank the chairman and the, the chairman. Gentlelady yield? I would be honored to yield to the chairman of our defense subcommittee. Uh, I thank the gentlelady from yielding, and I want to say thank you for being a valuable member of the subcommittee. And we appreciate the fact that you, we worked together to work out the language that was acceptable to all of us. And uh, we, we would accept your amendment. Further Thank discussion? You. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Dix. <coughs> I just want to commend the lady. This is, uh, again, another example of us not being uh, proactive, I believe, in trying to create job opportunities for the people coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan. And I, uh, I, I would just give you one example of somebody who is being proactive. Uh, the Puget Sound Naval Shipyard in Bremerton, my hometown, is taking wounded warriors from Fort Lewis over in Tacoma, and uh, 56 of them have been hired, uh, you know, who are, who are severe, many have very severe handicaps. So I think we as the, the government has got a responsibility here to try and find places for these wounded warriors. So I commend the, uh, the gentlelady for... Uh, uh, for her bringing this to our attention. These numbers, in my mind, are just unacceptable. Mr. Bishop. I thank the chair for yielding. I just wanted to commend the gentlelady for her uh, language and also wanted to, uh, uh, in that same vein, uh, remind and encourage members to look at the Hiring Heroes Act, which is a bipartisan uh, piece of legislation uh, that has been introduced to address some of the concerns that are raised and uh, I happen to be uh, one of the original co-sponsors, <coughs> along with Mr. Young and some others, uh, Mr. Dix, uh, and I'd urge uh, 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 others who are not a part of that to, to join that so that we can, on the authorizing side, uh, get legislation in place to really step up uh, the transition of our wounded warriors and our warriors from active duty to a civilian life. <coughs> I thank the chair for yielding. I thank the gentlelady for her uh, language. Is there further discussion? If not, the gentlelady is recognized for one minute to close her remarks. I just thank my colleagues very much and look forward to the report from the uh, administration and to working with this full committee and our subcommittee in advancing ideas to help reemploy our returning veterans. You've heard the discussion. All in favor of the amendment say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Amendment is agreed to. Uh, Ms. Granger. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. Clerk will report. Amendment offered by Ms. Granger. <coughs> at the appropriate place in the report, insert the following. Joint Strike Fighter, the committee remains committed to the success of the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter program. The recommendation provides funding for the procurement of 32 Joint Strike Fighter aircraft, the same as the President's request. Without objection, the reading is dispensed with. The general lady is recognized. Mr. Chairman, the Joint Strike Fighter is vital to our national security. It's unique and it's supported by the Air Force, the Navy, and the Marine Corps. This amendment simply reaffirms our commitment to this program. I have repeatedly asked our senior defense officials how important the Joint Strike Fighter is to our future defense. Their answers have been consistent and uh, <laughs> unified in saying that it is critical. Defense Secretary Gates said the Joint Strike Fighter will do everything the military services need it to do and become the backbone of the U.S. air combat for the next generation. <coughs> Commandant of the Marine Corps, General Amos, has repeatedly testified that the Joint Strike Fighter is critical to the Marine Corps. He said the JSF is the centerpiece of Marine Corps aviation modernization, and he is so committed to the Joint Strike Fighter that he is personally overseeing the Stovall program to ensure the Joint Strike Fighter program delivers the aircraft our nation requires. Admiral Roughhead, Chief of Naval Operations, said the carrier variant is critical to the Navy's future carrier air wing strike fighter capability and capacity. He stated the Joint Strike Fighter Program gives us <coughs> the advanced sensor, precision strike, firepower, and stealth capabilities that our fleet needs. I've been advised that the restructured Joint Strike Fighter flight test program is significantly ahead of schedule with respect to the number of test flights and test points completed, in, in particular the F-35B. Uh, the Stovall variant has exceeded its test point objectives by approximately 75% so far this year. 
It's already performed more than 100 vertical landings, surpassing the number of vertical landings required for shipboard testing later this fall. We've also been advised that solutions for all identified technical development issues are well understood and in place for implementation. The Joint Strike Fighter is essential to our nation's security and to that of our allies around the world. It's important that the committee take this opportunity to, to reinforce its support for this program. Mr. Young? Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Granger is chairman of the very important subcommittee on uh, foreign operations. But her real important job is as a member of the <coughs> defense subcommittee and makes a very strong contribution to all of the work of that subcommittee. And she and I have discussed this at length, and Mr. Dix and I have discussed it with, with each other and with Ms. Granger. And we agree that the truth of the matter is we wish this bill could have afforded to have more joint strike fighters included. But as you know, we're having to reduce by $9 billion. Uh, we were just <laughs> limited in how much we could add. So we agree with the language that she has, uh, that she has offered, and uh, we, we thank her for working with us to, to come up with language that, uh, that we could accept. And so we do accept it. Well, the gentleman uh, and Mr. Chairman, let me in just one second, I would, I would add that many of the amendments being offered today, the introducer, the member has, has worked with us in working out something that we can all agree with. Uh, that's very, very helpful. And so, and Ms. Granger certainly did that, Ms. Kapner did that, others have, have done that, and Mr. Wolf did that. So yes, I'm very happy to yield to the, uh, Mr. Dix. Well, we too want to accept this amendment. Uh, the Joint Strike Fighter last year was a, was a program that had some difficulty. There's no question about that. But this year, they have really turned the corner. And they turned the corner, but the problem is the budget was submitted months ago and didn't have the, the, this new information. And as, as uh, Congresswoman Granger said, the, uh, the, 35, the Joint Strike Fighter 35B, that airplane is now doing very, very well. I saw some film of it comparing it with the Harrier at the same time in development, and it's just like it was totally completely superior in every respect. And this is the Marine Corps' number one priority. <laughs> I just hope that somewhere through in the <coughs> process we could, we could increase this somehow if we can get the other body to agree with us because uh, this program, is, and, and the point of it is, if we could get more planes into the program, the cost comes down. And we have all these allies that are involved in this program. So, uh, you know, I, d I wish we could do more, but I, I support strongly uh, the report language. And also, I hope that the administration can clarify this position of saying that this, pr this program, uh, the 35B, is on probation. We have never been, we looked to the FAR, we've never been found the program that's been on probation <coughs> line up. And, and so, hopefully we can get that straight and get that cloud uh, cleared from this program and, and move forward. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd just like to add one thing. Uh, I've always been a very strong supporter of technology for, especially for aviation. It goes back to the first year I served in this Congress, I was on the Armed Services Committee, which is a great committee to serve on. And I remember this tremendously impressive Marine told me, he says, your Marines will go anywhere, will fight anybody, will invade, will go to the beaches, will go to the jungles, will go to the mountains, will go anywhere. Just promise me that you, as a congressman, will do everything you can to make sure that when we do fight, the airplanes that are circling overhead belong to us and not the enemy. And that's a commitment that I made long ago, and uh, I've tried to keep that commitment. And this, what Ms. Granger suggests here today is helping to keep that commitment, and I thank you very much. Well, the gentleman yield just for, for one brief comment yes, on what you said. You reminded me of something. We went through a very major com uh, controversy here in the Congress on the Osprey, yes, the we did. B-22, and Congress insisted that this plane be built. And we, on a, our recent trip, we, note, we found that the uh, Osprey was used, one, uh, to bring Osama bin Laden out and take it to the carrier, but also was used in Iraq to, uh, in, in Libya to save the troops went, that went down in F-15. So sometimes the Congress has to step in and give some direction to the uh, Pentagon on these issues because we have a lot of experience up here. 
I yield back, sir. Okay, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Further discussion, Mr. Farr. I, uh, I think there's a lot of benefits in, in, in this debate about trying to get a joint strike force, but I, fighter strike force, but I want to, I, I think the committee needs to also put this in perspective. At the same time, it's in a different budget, but uh, relative is we're cutting the Peace Corps. And it, the Peace Corps goes where the joint strike fighter doesn't go. It goes to the areas that are the most impoverished in the world, which lead, if you don't deal with the root causes of poverty, the, the, the counterinsurgency, as the military calls it, uh, you can't, you know, it's a, it's a good war preventer. And at the same time, we're talking about billions as a joint strike fighter, and we're talking about just a couple of millions. And just to put it in perspective, 20,000 people in the United States want to get in the Peace Corps. It's an all-time high demand. Ten countries want us to expand to them uh, that we've never been, including sub-Sahara Africa, where many people feel that the only way you're going to get an agricultural infrastructure built is to put Peace Corps volunteers out there. So um, I hope when we get around to a budget in, 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 in Mrs. Granger's um, uh, committee that we can also put perspective on doing that ounce of prevention, uh, which is let's bring the Peace Corps up to the President's ask. Thank you. Is there further relevant discussion? Hearing none, <laughs> the gentlelady is recognized for closing her. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I appreciate the support for this program. It is important, and it's certainly in, important in providing our troops with the very best equipment possible. And, Mr. Dix, you're exactly right. Increasing the production on this means we'll lower the cost, and that's what we all need to be looking at. Appreciate your time. All in favor of the amendment stay, say aye. Aye. All opposed, nay. Nay. Ayes have it, and the amendment is agreed to. Mr. Hinchy. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to uh, express my appreciation to uh, Chairman Young and to Ranking Member Dix and to everyone else who's been participating in, uh, in this uh, operation. If the gentleman will suspend, the clerk will, will read the amendment. Amendment offered by Mr. Hinchy at the appropriate place in the report insert the following. The committee strongly supports efforts to reduce the department's dependence on fossil fuels, increase the supply of renewable energy, and develop energy technology that will make servicemen and women safer and more effective in the field. Thank you. A according to the department, for every 24 fuel convoys that go into Afghanistan and Iraq, one warfighter is killed or wounded and for every extra dollar in the price of a barrel of oil, the department's fuel costs increase by 130 million. The committee is deeply concerned with the strategic, fiscal, tactical, and human costs associated with the department's energy needs and recognizes that investments are necessary to mitigate these challenges. Accordingly, the committee directs the Secretary of Defense to report to the Congressional Defense Committees within 90 days on the funding and programming included in the fiscal year 2012 budget and the future year's defense plan to address energy requirements. Well, thank you very much. I, I uh, very much appreciate that. And uh, one of the things that we've done in the context of, uh, of this bill is to begin to pay some attention to the, uh, the serious challenge with respect to energy that uh, the military operations in this country have. <coughs> and the Department of, uh, of Defense is the largest consumer in the world of uh, energy challenge. And uh, the situations that they're dealing with is at least fourfold. Our military, much like our nation, is dependent on foreign oil. For every extra dollar in the price of a barrel of oil that we know hurts our constituents at the pump, the department's fuel costs increase by $130 million. The department's annual energy bill is in tens of billions. <coughs> Rather than participating in offensive missions, many of our troops are stuck with the dangerous job of transporting fuel. And for every 24 of those fuel convoys in Afghanistan and Iraq, one warfighter involved in that transportation system is either killed or wounded. So the amendment is, is very simple. It would add report language, simply, highlighting this very serious challenge and help address the lack of centralized information and management regarding the department's energy use. I very much uh, appreciate uh, our chairman in uh, focusing on this. And uh, thank you.
thank you very much for the opportunity to put this idea out. Chairman Young. Well, Mr. Chairman, again, Mr. Hinchy is an important member of the subcommittee, and we appreciate this language. Uh, in addition to our regular hearings, which were numerous and lengthy and extremely well attended, I would tell you, Mr. Chairman, uh, the members of this subcommittee attended all of the hearings. Uh, in addition to those hearings, though, Mr. Dix and I had the opportunity to meet with Mr. Hinchy and another important member of our subcommittee, Mr. Kingston, on this very subject, along with some folks from the Department of Defense. And we appreciate Mr. Hinchy and Mr. Kingston working out the language with us, and we accept the language. Mr. Thank Dix. you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Dix. Well, we accept the, the language. I mean, obviously, the Department of Defense, being a huge consumer of energy, uh, Secretary Mabus has seen this. He is <laughs> dramatically trying to develop alternative fuels and to reduce by energy efficiency work the amount of energy we're using at our bases and our, in our equipment, uh, life cycle cost. I see my good friend from Alabama. Uh, life cycle cost is a very important factor that needs to be taken into account. Secretary Ash says 30% of uh, the cost of a weapon system is buying it, and 70% is ownership. And a lot of that ownership is the fuel consumption. So we've got to do more on energy efficiency. So we should accept the amendment. Is there further discussion? Down the lady from Wyoming. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, I reluctantly rise to oppose the amendment for the reason that I feel that the emphasis is misplaced. The emphasis is on fossil fuels rather than domestically produced energy versus foreign produced energy. We should be pursuing strategies to make sure that we are producing enough energy for our own Department of Defense that eliminates our reliance on foreign produced energy of any kind and put the emphasis on making sure that we are producing from all sources energy that is produced domestically, including <coughs> clean coal, and there is such a thing as clean coal, coal to liquids uh, and natural gas that's produced in the United States, which is a fossil fuel but is the cleanest burning fossil fuel there is. And with the continued discovery of additional natural gas sources in this country, we can reduce our reliance on foreign energy in a way that enhances our ability as a nation uh, to pursue domestic policies that do not rely so much on foreign energy which has been alleged to be one of the reasons we end up embattled in the Middle East to begin with. Mr. Chairman, if I may, I deeply appreciate what uh, uh, our... The, the gentleman will suspend. We'll have time to close in a moment. Pardon me? Suspend. Mr. Moran. One of the big problems we have uh, with the use of fossil-based uh, energy is the convoys. As the gentleman said in the language, we lose one soldier, either dead or severely wounded, for every 24 convoys. One of the things the Defense Department is doing, particularly in Afghanistan, is using the power of the sun to generate energy. That's an alternative, clean, sustainable kind of energy that uh, you don't have to put as many people at risk in order to uh, generate. That's the kind of thing they're developing. I don't think this needs to get into uh, the classic uh, argument over uh, whether we drill uh, inland or offshore, it's a matter of enabling, uh, of encouraging the Defense Department to find ways that are a little safer uh, for our troops in terms of uh, acquiring the kind of energy uh, they need, particularly in places like uh, Afghanistan. Thank you. Ms. Kaplan. Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, I, I rise in support of the gentleman's amendment and share the gentlelady's concern that whatever we do in terms of energy ought to be very broad based. I rise because I represent several transportation companies that face um, the very difficult <coughs> and uh, most dangerous job really, uh, and that is moving this fuel to front. And um, I want to thank the gentleman for bringing this up out of the morass to show how vulnerable our soldiers really are in terms of these uh, fuel convoys. I will also place on the record um, that the fully landed price of delivering a gallon 
of gas to our soldiers at the front is $400 a gallon. That's an astounding number to think about, but when we look at the actual defense expenditures that we have, uh, it is hurting us a great deal on, on many levels. First of all, the human one, but also uh, the economic one. Um, I really uh, uh, thank the gentleman for his leadership consistently, and I think our committee on a bipartisan basis should be very proud because if you go to the uh, website of the Marine Corps, and I hate to favor the Marine Corps, I do have a little prejudice there, uh, but I do think they have the best website in terms of leading America forward uh, toward energy independence. And I think many of the gentle lady's concerns will be uh, allayed if she simply goes there. And this is something that we as a committee have been forceful in our leadership on with uh, the great, great efforts of Congressman Hinchy and so many others. So I thank the gentleman for offering this amendment and rise in strong support. Further discussion? Mr. Rothman. Mr. Chairman, thank you for recognizing me. I just want to say that I support the gentle lady's notion that we should be encouraging domestic production of uh, our own energy uh, requirements. Um, whether there is clean coal or not, uh, we'll leave that debate for another day. But I certainly support the gentlelady's gentle notion about the, the supporting domestic production to meet America's <coughs> own energy needs. I don't think, however, that the Hinchy Amendment is contradictory to our shared view on that subject and just taken on its own is a valid um, and worthy uh, element for the report language. But I did want to uh, acknowledge the legitimacy of the gentle lady's uh, overriding uh, message, uh, but say that uh, Mr. Hinchy's um, encouragement in the report to develop these alternative energy sources was necessary for the purposes described, but does not go to meet our national energy consumption needs. Mr. Thank Chairman, you. Yes, sir. I, I just don't think this is an either or proposition. We can have energy efficiency and energy alternatives, and at the same time, do the drilling that's necessary to develop domestic resources. I think we should do them both. Thank you. Mr. Hinchy is recognized for one minute to close. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I, uh, I deeply respect actually what was said by uh, the, uh, this lady just a couple of minutes ago, and I have nothing, frankly, to disagree with anything that she said. The main objective here is to try to reduce the dependence on foreign oil, foreign fuel, and to promote other means of energy production, and to make that energy production safer and more secure, and that includes energy production generated here internally within our country, consistently with what uh, she had to say. So the, uh, uh, the report language that we're suggesting here is in no way contrary to uh, her, uh, her uh, opinion, and I am very much in favor of it. We've got to concentrate on the, uh, the way in which to generate more and more other means of energy and to do it in clear and effective ways and be less and less dependent upon foreign oil. And that's exactly what we're doing. So I thank you very much for uh, your, your uh, comments. Time for discussion has expired. All in favor of the amendment say aye. Aye. Opposed nay. No. Amendment is agreed to. Uh, Mr. Bonner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment in the form of report language at the desk. Clerk will report. An amendment offered by Mr. Bonner at the appropriate place in the report, insert the following. I ask that the uh, reading be dispensed. Without objection, the reading is dispensed with. The gentleman is recognized. Mr. Chairman, this is a timely amendment following the uh, previous amendment by Mr. Hingey, and I want to pick up on the comments that Ms. Kaptur made about the cost <coughs> to deliver gasoline to our soldiers in the battlefield of $400 a gallon. Uh, this amendment in the form of report language would encourage the Secretary of the <coughs> Army to pursue improvements to the M1 Abrams tank engine. This engine, my friends, that powers the M1 Abrams tank is much the same engine as it was 30 years ago when it was first introduced. And yet during that same period of time, modifications for survivability and lethality have increased the weight of the tank by 10 tons, pushing the tank to its limit for space, weight, and power. With the M1 series tanks expected to remain the centerpiece of ground combat formations for decades, it is important that the Army not neglect 
important upgrades to the engine to include, include improvements for both reliability as well as fuel efficiency. The proposed improvements to the M1 Abrams tank engine will provide an average of 10 to 14 percent improvements in fuel efficiency while almost doubling the reliability of the engine. In addition, the projected savings resulted from this program are estimated to be $2 billion in fuel and maintenance costs. During a March 16th hearing of our subcommittee, our former colleague and the current Secretary of the Army, John McHugh, noted that implementing fuel efficiency for the Abrams tank is a priority. <coughs> the Army is trying to bring these improvements sooner as they look ahead at the acquisition objectives of the Abrams tank's modernization program. The comments by Secretary McHugh validate the need for improvements and highlight the acquisition shortfall of the Abrams tank's engine. So, Mr. Chairman, as we continue to pursue upgrades in weapon lethality and armor survivability and other factors of the M1 Abrams tank, I believe it is vitally important that we concurrently upgrade the engines as well. The bottom line is this. These engines are currently operating on technology that is more than 30 years old, wasting fuel and costing the taxpayers valuable money. With the Army making a commitment to extending the service life of these tanks well into 2045, it is vitally importantly important that we focus on the upgrades to the tank and the engine, especially those that will result in a better, safer tank for our soldiers and cost savings for the American taxpayers. And with that, I'm happy to yield. Chairman Young. Well, Mr. Chairman, first, uh, I want to thank you for appointing Mr. Bonner to the Defense Subcommittee this year. He is a very, very, very constructive and attentive member of that subcommittee. Actually, this is not his first preference. He wanted to add money to develop this engine, and I wish we could have done it. But w this bill was so finely tuned. It's like one of those <coughs> water balloons. If you push it in here, it's going to come out here. And so we asked him to not to introduce the uh, amendment to actually add the money, we just didn't have the money. Uh, and we, but he did work with us on a language that was acceptable to him, and it's acceptable to us, and so we accept the gentleman's amendment. Mr. Dix? Uh, we too accept the gentleman's amendment, and again, this is just another example of trying to get the Army uh, to look at options that will reduce energy <coughs> consumption. And these, these tanks, I, I, and we, didn't, we just looked this up, uh, some of them get six tenths of a mile per gallon. Others get, with the, with the cooler ones, the, uh, use three gallons per mile. So at at four hundred dollars a gallon, uh, we're not you know we're not using a lot of tanks by the way in in Afghanistan. But I think this is a worthy idea, especially as we keep this line open to work on improving the. Uh, and reducing fuel consumption. So we, we definitely accept the amendment. Ms. Caffrey? Yes. Um, Mr. Chairman, I rise in support of the gentleman's amendment and um, uh, welcome him to our subcommittee. Uh, let me say that uh, the Abrams tank is made in Ohio, and um, it is a workhorse. And uh, I don't know how many members have ever been in an Abrams tank. Uh, I did it with my hosiery and everything, but... <laughs> uh, it was, let me tell you, it's quite an experience, quite an experience, and uh, the speed, the accuracy uh, of this, and the ability to maintain its position, even on inclines, uh, it, it really, you, th you think a Ferris wheel was great, you ought to ride in an Abrams, Abrams tank. Um, just this morning, I was on the phone with the Warren Tank Command uh, with his exact request. In fact, I was late to this meeting this morning. And I was asking for a briefing about propulsion systems in all of our overground uh, uh, propulsion systems uh, in the um, purview of the tank command. Nothing could be more important than leapfrogging to the next generation in terms of our propulsion system. So I couldn't be happier to stand up and support the, the gentleman's uh, amendment and would uh, invite you to join us in Warren, Michigan. Uh, as we listen to what the Army has to say about future combat systems and our overground uh, fuel efficient 
uh, alternatives for the future. So would thank you, you so much. You just I'd briefly. be pleased to yield to the gentleman. Uh, I just thought of a, a comment. Uh, we had a meeting with uh, General Corelli, uh, and I asked him, are you taking life cycle cost into account of when you buy these new Army systems? He said, well, we're going to do it now, but we've never done it before. So again, this is one of those situations where we pay you know, 30% to buy it, 70% to own it, you better look at fuel consumption going in. Thank you for yielding. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, in, in uh, using up the remaining part of my time, I just wanted to say that one of our biggest, and I just informed the committee of this, because regardless of what subcommittee we're on, we're all Americans fighting for a better country and for a better future. What has been most shocking about the U.S. military to me was, without our subcommittee's effort, they would not have an energy consciousness over the Department of Defense at every level. Sure. And just to use an example, my own state, just take one small part to the Guard. When I said to the Guard one time, how much do you spend on energy? Well, nobody ever asked them that question before. They went back, looked at the books, and cooked the numbers. They come back, they said, Congresswoman, one-third. And then they said to themselves, one-third? I'm spending one-third on energy? So we began to ask the question, what if you could put that to readiness? What if you could put that uh, to training? What if you could put that to other equipment? And all of a sudden, there was a total culture change inside. Part of what the gentleman is doing today is helping to change the culture uh, of inertia that has exist, you know, existed probably for 50 years over there. And uh, we are changing that. So our being elected has been worth it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. Further discussion. Glad to support the gentleman's amendment. If not, Mr. Bond is recognized one minute. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I thank everyone for their comments. I especially thank uh, you for giving me this opportunity to serve on this subcommittee. And uh, Chairman Young and the former chairman and current ranking member, Mr. Dix, and their staffs who helped work through this. As Chairman Young noted, it was not my first choice. But I do think this is, in the tight budget times that we're facing, uh, an acceptable solution to uh, sending a strong message to the department that we need to squeeze every dollar we can, invest in new technology, and make sure that we can provide for the very brave young men and women that put their lives on the line every day so that we can live in this great country. And I yield back. Uh, time has expired. All in favor of the amendment say aye. 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 Opposed, no. The amendment is agreed to. Uh, Ms. McCollum. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I wish to um, speak to amendment number one at the desk. It's on military van. Clerk will read. Amendment offered by Ms. McCollum. At the end of the bill, before the short title, add the following new section. Section, not more than $200 million of the funds made available by this act may be expended for military musical units as defined in section 974 of Title X, United States Code. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This amendment is identical to one that was adopted unanimously by a voice vote last month as part of the National Defense Authorization Bill. Excuse me. According to the Pentagon, spending on military bans in fiscal year 2011 will total $320 million. The Army alone currently has over 100 uh, bans employing 4,000 uh, 600 full-time, full-time professional musicians and their support staff. The Air Force, Navy, and Marines also have dozens of bands with full-time <coughs> professional musicians. Now, Congress conducts no oversight over this portion of the budget, and so it's no wonder to me that the number of bands and their cost to taxpayers has grown in recent years. Now, like many of you, we have military ties. I grew up on and around military bases as a young girl. And I understand the importance that military bands have in our tradition and their support and morale for our troops. And that's why my amendment continues to provide $200 million <coughs> for the Pentagon to continue its tradition and at the same time reduce the Pentagon spending on band and musicians. Uh, Mr. Young. Mr. Chairman, uh, I would like to ask the gentlelady a question. Just to make sure that this is the same language uh, that is uh, in the NDAA bill that's passed. Yes, yes. It, it oh, you can you can attest to this that it's identical. 
uh, that, that is what uh, it looks identical to me and it looks identical as to uh, what my staff uh, had asked the okay. people to at the revisor's office to Well, do. Mr. Chairman, in view of that assurance, uh, we reluctantly accept this amendment. Mr. Dix? As a former clarinet and saxophone player, <laughs> uh, I rise in deep, deep concern over this amendment, but I'm willing to go along with the chairman. It's in the authorization bill, so I think we have no choice but to accept it. Further discussion? That lady is recognized for one minute. Mr. Chairman, it, it is because we're facing such difficult times. I think that even, even choices that, that tug to our heartstrings have to be part of the discussion as we're looking at cutting. Families all across this country see uh, critical services reduced. We're cutting other parts in this budget, uh, military uh, equipment upgrades, <coughs> energy upgrades that have been discussed earlier. And uh, I think that it is only fair that this part of the Pentagon's budget also be asked to, to share in the sacrifice. And with that, I thank the chairman. Any further discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Aye. Chairs and doubts. All those in favor of the amendment, raise their hand. Likewise, those opposed, and the amendment is agreed to. Uh, Mr. Graves. Chairman, an amendment to that. Clerk will read. Amendment offered by Mr. Graves at the appropriate place Without in the report. The reading is dispensed with. The gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a very simple uh, technical amendment that would provide uh, this committee more oversight over the uh, common food management system. Uh, as many of you may know, back in 2005, the Department of Defense uh, did a report <coughs> studying how they could make uh, things more efficient, more effective in, uh, for the troops in food delivery. And uh, they concluded that coming up with one common system to deliver would be the most effective uh, way to do that. And as a result, uh, $60 million has been expended uh, to that effort. And uh, as we're closing in on the date, I think it's about three and a half years away in which completion should be finalized. Uh, this just simply asks that uh, the Defense Logistics Agency, who is uh, in charge of this, uh, provide this committee with a report within 60 days demonstrating uh, that we're on target. Are there any barriers in place, uh, anything that may prevent or impede the deployment, and what steps would be taken to resolve any of those issues? in addition to uh, uh, another analysis as to the cost effectiveness of this program. And I think it's in the best interest of uh, our troops that uh, we, uh, we support this, uh, this effort that's going on, but at the same time have the necessary oversight to make sure that uh, we're on target to achieve the desired goal. Mr. Chairman, again, Mr. Graves was kind enough to uh, work with us uh, on this language, as well as his staff. Uh, and we think he's come up with a, something that we should have thought about, but we didn't. And we thank him very much for offering this, this amendment, and we do accept it. Thank you. Mr. Dix? We're prepared to discuss the amendment. You heard the discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. <coughs> the amendment is agreed to, and the gentleman uh, wins his first battle. <laughs> <laughs> Are there further amendments? Mr. Clay. I have a member of the desk designated as number one. Number one. Amendment offered by Mr. Flake, page 154, strike line 17 through 23, yes, and objection. insert the following. Dispense with. Uh, without objection, the, the reading is dispensed with. The gentleman is recognized. Mr. Chairman, uh, in 2009, the Pakistan Counterinsurgency Fund was established in order to uh, help Pakistan build its uh, counterinsurgency capabilities. The underlying bill before us uh, appropriates $1.1 $1 billion for that fund. Included in the bill is a provision that limits the amount that can be obligated or expended to $275 million. That's 25 percent of the amount allocated until the Secretary of Defense and State uh, submit a report that outlines a strategy uh, for assistance to Pakistan. I think this is a good, uh, good report language, but it should be better in my view. There's going to be uh, intense uh, interest on the floor, I can tell you, in limiting the amount of money that we're spending or giving to Pakistan. Uh, Pakistan's performance or non-performance uh, over the past six years uh, that uh, Osama bin Laden was hiding there uh, is, is going to rub a lot of people the wrong way, I think, as it should. Uh, this amendment would simply say that, uh, that it would just take the oversight that we already have in the report language a little bit further. Uh, it would say that uh, the 25 percent is allocated, 
but then we have when the report comes back from the Secretary of Defense and State that we have 30 days to review it before any money flows. And if this body feels that we need to act, that we need to go to the floor and proffer legislation to restrict or reallocate or limit uh, the amount of funding, that we have time to do that. Under the existing bill, that uh, report is issued just as a perfunctory measure and the funding continues to go. So I, I could have offered language that, that cut funding. I think a lot of people uh, would be inclined to do that. But I'm simply saying that, uh, that this body ought to be a little more deliberative and that we ought to have 30 days to actually review the report that is issued. If you're going to issue a report and call for a report, let's give this body time to actually review it. If, if we decide that uh, everything is good, then the money flows after 30 days. But this gives us 30 days to act before the rest of that money is obligated. And I reserve the balance of my time. Chairman Young. Well, Mr. Chairman, uh, the gentleman was kind enough again to uh, offer us in advance uh, this amendment. And we were able to review it. And again, uh, I wish we'd have thought of it. It's a good idea, and we accept it. Mr. Dix. We accept the gentleman's amendment. Time for discussion has expired. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Minutes agreed to. Further amendments? Mr. Bill. LaTourette. Clerk will read. Which amendment is the gentleman off? Clerk will read. Amendment offered by Mr. La Tourette at the appropriate place in the report insert the committee believes that once the DOD Without inspector objection, general. The reading is dispensed with the gentleman's recognized. <laughs> Chairman Young. Well, Mr. Chairman, Mr. La Tourette was very kind enough to offer us this amendment this morning. And we have not really had adequate time to do the professional analysis that we would really like to do uh, on any of these amendments. And we try to be very thorough and make sure that we know what we're doing. Uh, in this case, I don't find this language offensive but I reserve the right to come back to Mr. La Tourette one, one of these days and suggest that we should do something different. But I, uh, I would not make that suggestion until such time as we've had a little bit more time to, to analyze what, just exactly what this means. But we'll, we will not oppose this amendment at this point. Uh, 
this is probably the last opportunity to amend the, <laughs> to amend the report. So I, I could tell you yes, and then you wouldn't have a chance. But I wouldn't do that to you because you're my friend. Uh, <laughs> we'll accept the amendment, but we're not through with it. <laughs> Mr. Dix, you know, we're prepared to accept the amendment. We think it's, you know, ha just having had a chance to look at it very briefly, I think this is uh, timely, and uh, let's see what the Inspector General has to say. I yield back. Would the Chairman like to close in, with one minute? All in favor of the amendment, say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Aye. Aye. Amendment appears to carry. Uh, the Chair will announce that uh, we would like to finish this bill before we break for the uh, House session, which starts, I think, at 12. Yeah. Uh, the uh, ag rule will be up, I think, no, no, we'll vote on the, uh, uh, on the uh, Milcon veterans. And then uh, we, the House will take up the rule for the ag bill. And then immediately go into discussion, as I understand it, of the Ag Bill, Ms. Kingston, is that correct? Yes, sir. So it's important that we finish this Quick. bill before we uh, break here. So temper your remarks one tenth of a percent. Mr. Flake. Amendment to desk number two. Just a one percent. Clerk will read. Amendment offered by Mr. Flake. At the end of the bill, before the spending reduction Without account, consent. insert the following. <laughs> Without objection, the reading is dispensed with. The gentleman is recognized. Thank the chairman. Th this committee has been very careful to comply with the earmark moratorium that's been put in place. Other committees, uh, in my view and, and the view of uh, some of the members here, have not been so careful. Um, just some of the headlines that uh, came out after the defense authorization bill was passed. Um, it says, uh, Washington Post said, on armed services panel, earmarks are in the eye of the beholder. Okay. Uh, National Journal said, add on to one is an earmark to another. I think it's important that we make sure that, uh, that all committees comply uh, with the earmark moratorium that's been put in place. This amendment uh, would simply uh, prevent an entity that I in the past has received earmark funding for a project under a particular program element or budget activity from receiving funds added by a member in this year's defense authorization for a project under the same program element. So it's specifically targeted at the defense authorization bill where a lot of people think uh, that there were earmarks by another name there. Um, no sooner had the markup concluded than there were members issuing press releases touting their success in securing funding for various locations and even entities, something that was uh, expressly forbidden by the guidance issued by that committee. But I, I think it's important that this committee has worked very hard and, and uh, it's been a tough lift, I know, for a lot on this committee to comply with the earmark moratorium I don't, would hate to see the good work done by this committee and others uh, be squandered elsewhere in the Congress if, uh, if we all get the blame for earmarks slipping through. This would simply prevent that from happening, and I reserve. Chairman Young. <coughs> uh, Mr. Chairman, we saw this amendment in advance, uh, but we're not going to agree to it. Uh, because the, uh, the effect could be far-reaching, and I would, would say that the gentleman has been very uh, uh, determined in his battle against earmarks. Uh, we did not fund any of the member projects that were authorized by the uh, NDAA bill. I know a lot of members did have success in getting what they would consider an earmark in that authorization bill. We didn't fund any of those. What this amendment goes to is our companies, contractors that are developing maybe ongoing programs that they've done for years. And if they had an earmark, they couldn't, they could not be part of the process uh, anymore. Uh, we're not sure how, what the effect of that would be. And I think it's maybe a little bit dangerous uh, to, ac to accept this language. It is bill language, it's not report language. And so uh, we'd like to support the gentleman's position because we've had a, had a love fest going so far here today. That was really nice, by the way. But, uh, <laughs> uh, to be co on, the, on the side of caution, I'm just not sure that this wouldn't have effect on ongoing programs that are programs of record, that are programs that have been authorized and funded for a number of years. So uh, I have to oppose this amendment. Mr. Dix. I, 
support the chairman's position on this one. Mr. Rothman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, uh, understanding the chairman's admonition to only speak if you think one thing is very important, uh, I think this is important. I have enormous respect and regard for the gentleman from Arizona and for his efforts in particular to uh, rid our appropriations bills of unworthy earmarks. I disagree with the gentleman this several times. Uh, I believe that uh, we elected representatives have a much better understanding of our districts than federal bureaucrats when it comes to deciding on the very small amount of discretionary spending that the Congress has used for earmarks to decide which projects in our districts deserve funding as opposed to letting some bureaucrat in Washington decide it. Most of these earmarks, as you know, come from the executive branch. We deserve to have some, but uh, they need to be transparent, they need to be legitimate, and they need to and let our constituents decide whether we have not handled this responsibly. I, for one, don't know any of my colleagues who have proposed an unworthy earmark. I certainly have not. I just simply wanted to say to my friend, uh, and to just for the record, that I do not accept the notion that all earmarks are bad or that future appropriations bills should be absent of all earmarks. They simply should be transparent and valid and stand the test of public scrutiny. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Lewis. Mr. Chairman, if you would, I, uh, let, let me say to the gentleman that he makes a, an important point as we deal with the authorizing committee. The chairman, in turn, has indicated that we have not funded any of these suggested uh, or described earmarks. In turn, the committee should remember that perhaps the best illustration of the committee exercise itself uh, regarding a very important program, regardless of the department's view of such a program, <coughs> involves the predator. The predator would not have existed, never would have been the Bosnian nor the Middle East, if an authorizing bill had not described its importance and urged that we move forward. Over time, the committee chose uh, to fund those avenues, and the committee was right. So be very cautious about throwing away uh, both our constitutional responsibility uh, as well as the expertise of the members as we go forward. Mr. Bishop. Mr. Chairman, I want to associate myself with the remarks of the gentleman, Mr. Lewis, as well as Mr. Rothman. And I can think of uh, any number of earmarks that have been put in by this committee <laughs> that have really, really worked for the benefit of uh, our men and women in uniform, their families, and the general public and Americans uh, all over the country uh, and all over the world. Uh, I think of one in particular that affects a lot of, <coughs> of, uh, uh, of our military families uh, is the bone marrow program. Uh, which was conceived of as an earmark by uh, Chairman Young uh, almost 20 years ago. Uh, and it started as a, as a tiny earmark. But through that bone marrow program, uh, the research has developed and expanded uh, to the point that now the sickle <coughs> cell disease, which is a disease that impacts uh, African Americans and those of African descent, has almost uh, come to the point where it can be eliminated and cured as a result of the bone marrow research <coughs> that started as an earmark uh, by, by, by Mr. Young uh, some 20 years ago. So I think that uh, this Congress ought to be very, very zealous in its efforts to preserve the, the separation of powers and that we ought to jealously guard uh, our ability uh, to exercise our constitutional rights when it comes to appropriations. And uh, so I associate myself with uh, the remarks of, of those who uh, favor the uh, judicious use of, uh, of the earmark process. <coughs> Mr. Tatar. <coughs> Mr. Mr. Chairman, uh, I, I, in fact, look forward to, uh, uh, in this situation in Arizona where the fires are, if we have to vote for appropriations to help the state of Arizona, even though somebody might call it an earmark, uh, I think it's an appropriate thing for us to do. I think that notion that um, my colleague, Mr. Wolf, can't even name a study group 
because it may violate a rule that the Congress has set up uh, to try to deal with earmarks. The truth of the matter is that we were told if we got rid of earmarks, it was going to solve the nation's fiscal crisis. I think we all know and knew then that that was nonsense. And it's really unfortunate that we have gotten our committee in a situation where because of this irrational um, approach on trying to preclude us from exercising our own judgment about things, uh, that we're even in this situation. I think in this particular instance, in this amendment, I know that the gentleman's not saying that if something was funded that is saving the lives or preventing major injuries for our troops, if it was funded in a previous year because it was an earmark, that somehow it's precluded from being funded now. And that uh, that wouldn't make a lot of sense. We've made a lot of improvements, whether it's in body armor uh, uh, or in, uh, in other kinds of uh, services or equipment that's needed. And, uh, and a lot of that has happened because of earmarks. So, you know, I think this is an unfortunate amendment. Um, and as I indicate, I'm opposed <coughs> to it. And I look forward to the opportunity to help the gentleman out in the state of Arizona with his particular problem, even if someone says it's an earmark. Mr. Oliver? Mr. Chairman, uh, it seems to me that uh, most of the problem that has been suggested by a number of people is already taken care of in the gentleman's amendment. In his subsection B, uh, it states that the limitation under subsection A shall not apply to a project if the Secretary of Defense certifies to the Congressional Defense Committee that this project is vital to the national security interests of the United States. So it seems, just seems to me that uh, uh, I want to defend the, the gentleman for his drafting of the amendment. It seems to me it takes care of the problems that have been raised. Is there further discussion? The, uh, before the gentleman's recognized, uh, the chair recognizes that there is a policy against earmarks. Uh, and we have certified to the full House that there will be no earmarks in any of these bills. Uh, the chairman of this subcommittee and the ranking member uh, assure us that there are no earmarks in this bill. Uh, however, I'm, I'm concerned that the chairman uh, has not had time to look at the possible ramifications of this amendment. And for that reason, I would oppose the uh, gentleman's amendment until we can be assured uh, that the chairman is uh, happy with it. <laughs> now, to, to close one minute, uh, the gentleman of Texas. One question. Uh, I just want to ask the gentleman uh, from Arizona, the way I read your amendment in, in uh, response to the um, distinguished gentleman from California's comment, the way I read your amendment, therefore, the Department of Defense could no longer fund the Predator Program because it was previously the subject of an earmark in an authorization bill in a prior Congress. No. Well, the way your amendment reads, it says it can't fund any, it can't award any project within the program element that was the subject of a request by a member of Congress in a prior Congress. So we can no longer fund the Predator Program? This is specifically with the authorization bill that was passed this past year. Uh, no, where's the gentleman's that reading too much into it. I don't see that. Uh, none of the funds. Okay, you're talking about. Uh, Specifically for the National Defense Authorization Act 2000. Well, then you're. And, and then it also specifically makes the point that uh, the, the project would have to be requested again by a member. This is already taken up by the committee, so that would apply. I think the, the gentleman. Why would you unnecessary then? I, I thank the gentleman from, from Massachusetts. The gentleman's recognized for one minute to close. Thank you. I thank the gentleman from Massachusetts for raising the point that there is a national security waiver here. If it's a program that is in the security interest, it could be done. I. I, I commend the chairman, as I mentioned, for complying with the earmark ban. What I'm trying to do is ensure that other committees don't undo the good work that this committee has done in this regard. And that's what the, the intent of this is. I know when I'm beat, I know I'm not going to win this one. I won't call for a roll call on it. But, it. but I am concerned, and I think some of the members of this committee have registered their concern with me, saying, if we had done what other committees have done here, we'd be tarred and feathered here. And, and they're probably right. Uh, I just want to make sure that uh, we don't allow uh, what has traditionally gone on uh, in, the, in this Congress uh, to go on with another committee. And that was the purpose of this amendment, and so I, I yield back. Time of debate has expired. All in favor of the amendment say aye. Aye. Opposed say nay. No. no. 
Mays appear to have it. Mays had it. The amendment is not agreed to. I want to applaud the gentleman for being such a great prognosticator. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> gentleman uh, is recognized. I think the gentleman has not always been so magnanimous. I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have an amendment uh, designated as number three. Clerk will read. Amendment offered by Mr. Flake. At the appropriate place in the bill, insert the following. Uh, Section as, not as later as than as 90 as days as after as the date. requested to dispense with reading and is so ordered. Uh, Mr. Chairman, as the committee is aware, that at the direction of Secretary Gates, the Armed uh, Services identified $178 billion uh, in savings stemming from efficiency initiatives over the course of uh, FY12 through 16. $78 billion comes off the top, goes down to pay down the deficit, uh, but $100 billion will be reinvested in high-priority programs within the services. This amendment, uh, and I don't think that this is controversial, uh, would simply require a little more thorough reporting uh, on the part of the Defense Department. This committee in the report language has already noted that, uh, that there is a little uh, lacking in terms of report language here in, in terms of what is being required of the Department of Defense. This would simply uh, force them to compile a report that provides further clarification, detail, and specify uh, what the savings are and how they will be reinvested. Uh, this uh, clarification would be helpful because as I mentioned, according to the committee report, quote, the committee finds a majority of these savings have been taken in broad categories of better business practices and reorganizations and believes that such savings oftentimes never materialize. So this is simply extending our oversight a little further and I reserve. Chairman Young? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, uh, I accept this amendment on behalf of the committee, but it's gonna give me an opportunity uh, to say why. Uh, I don't need to read from this Constitution here because I've memorized it and I've made this speech so many times, but I will read from it. Article 1, Section 9 says, no money shall be drawn from the Treasury but in consequence of appropriations made by law. Uh, if you read the Constitution, and I carry this with me all the time, uh, there's nothing in the Constitution that says that we can only appropriate what the administration or the executive branch asks for. But it does say they can't spend any money that we didn't first appropriate. So it protects the uh, separation of powers as, the, uh, as de determined by our forefathers. But here's the interesting part and why it, why it speaks to Mr. Flake's amendment. It's, it also says that same section, it says, and a regular statement and account of the receipts and expenditures of all public money shall be published from time to time. And we do a pretty good job doing that. But in this amendment, calling for a very definite report uh, follows this constitutional provision. And uh, that's why I'm, I'm really glad to accept this, this amendment. And I appreciate the gentleman's opportunity, give me the opportunity to mention this part of the Constitution that gives con Congress total responsibility for making the decisions on appropriations. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Dicks. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Dix, Mr. Pathan. Just a quick question of the author. This is the $100 billion in savings that President Obama asked the department to uh, fund, and this was uh, offered uh, by Secretary Gates. Is this the same $100 billion? That is correct. Okay, and so what you're saying is you want to know in more detail how they plan on saving and what they plan on reinvesting in. Precisely. Okay. Thank you very much. Mr. Dix. We're prepared to accept the gentleman's amendment. For further discussion. I think this one will do a little better. Time is, ex <laughs> time is expired. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. Ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. <laughs> further amendments. Ms. Careful. McCollum. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have uh, a couple of amendments left, but two of them, uh, this committee uh, has already voted on before, and so I would ask at this time if the clerk could read Amendment Number Two. Clerk will read. Amendment offered by Ms. McCollum. At the appropriate place in the bill, insert the following. Section, none of the funds made available by this act may be used to enter into a contract, memorandum of understanding, or cooperative agreement with, make a grant to, or provide a loan or loan guarantee to, any corporation that any unpaid federal tax liability 
that has been assessed for that for which all judicial and administrative res remedies have been exhausted or have lapsed and that is be not being paid in a timely manner pursuant to an agreement with the authority responsible for collecting the tax liability. Mr. Chairman, I think the uh, amendment is self-explanatory, and this is something in which our committee has supported before in the past. So I'd ask your support. Mr. Chairman, yeah. Mr. Chairman, we accept this amendment. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Dix? We accept the amendment. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, no. Amendment is agreed to. Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment number three, which this committee has also in the past um, moved, moved forward, and I would ask your permission to have the clerk read that. It is on. Clerk will read. Amendment offered by Ms. McCollum at the end of the bill before the short title insert the following section none of the funds made available by this act may be used to enter into a contract memorandum of understanding or cooperative agreement with make a grant to or provide a loan or loan guarantee to any corporation that was convicted of a felony criminal violation under any federal law within the preceding 24 months. Ladies recognize. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Once again, that this, this committee has moved um, forward in supporting this language before, and I'd ask the committee support on this bill. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, yeah? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, this is similar to the amendment just agreed to, uh, and uh, we do accept it and do ag agree to it. And I want to thank the gentlelady for giving us advance notice of these amendments uh, early on so that we have a chance to review them, and thank you very much. Mr. Dix? We do accept. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, um, uh, the uh, next... Uh, if the gentlelady was... I'm sorry. Mr. Dix. <coughs> I know. Uh, this, you, you've taken state state activities out of this, isn't that correct? Absolutely. We worked with the committee and we took we followed the committee's <coughs> recommendations and I want to thank the committee staffs on both sides for their help in this. We'll accept the amendment. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed no. Yes. Members agree to. Gentlelady. Mr. Chairman, the last amendment I have, and we were working with both committee staffs on this, but getting it from Ledge Council, we, d we were only just recently so that the exact Clerk will read. has been distributed. Amendment offered by Ms. McCollum. At the appropriate place in Title VIII, add the following new section. Section, of the amounts made available by this act, not more than 250000 may be obligated for any single contract for the sponsorship of a motorsports racing driver, racing team or racing event, any single contract for the sponsorship of a fishing team or fishing tournament, any single contract for the sponsorship of any professional wrestling event, or any single contract for the sponsorship of any ultimate or extreme fighting event until the end of the 30-day period beginning on the date on which a copy of the contract is submitted to the Committee on Appropriations of both Houses of Congress. Gentlelady's recognized. Thank you. This is different than the, um, the the NASCAR amendment that was was on the on the floor um, a month ago. I, I want to be clear what this amendment does. This amendment would exercise this committee's oversight over the federal government by pr by requiring the Department of Defense to seek approval from the House and Senate Appropriations Committee for any motorsport, fishing, or wrestling sponsorship for more than two hundred fifty thousand dollars. The full committee has already included an amendment in the Military Construction Veterans Affair Appropriation Bill. This year, the Department of Defense is spending nearly $100 million in taxpayers' funds for motorsports events. In the last decade, hundreds of millions of taxpayers' dollars have been spent to sponsor stock cars, race cars, hot rods, Indy cars, motorcycle racing, all in the name of military recruitment. At a time when our nation is fighting two wars and facing a fiscal crisis, why are we borrowing money from China, Russia, Saudi Arabia to pay for multi-million dollar racing sponsorships for millionaire race drivers? With America fighting two wars, the Army does not need to be spending $7.4 billion or half a million dollars per race to buy a decal for one car. Unbelievably, the National Guard spent $20 million to sponsor one race car driver. The Marine Corps, Coast Guard, and Navy have all canceled their NASCAR sponsorships because they don't have a good way of measuring their return on investment. But what about recruitment? Racing sponsorships are critical, critical to recruitment. We've been told that, right? Well, it's wrong. Here's an example. In 2010, the National Guard spent $645,000 to sponsor a single NASCAR race, the Air Guard 400. 
$650,000 sponsorship generated 439 recruitment leads. Only six of those leads were qualified leads to potential recruits. How many enlistments for $650,000? Zero. That's 600 and uh, 455,000 taxpayer dollars and zero airmen. The Army's results don't seem much better. According to Lieutenant General uh, Benjamin Freakley, who oversees the Army's motorsports program, only about one out of four of their target audience at NASCAR races are 16 to 24 years old, could even qualify to join the military because of education, obesity, or criminal conduct. It's hard to imagine fishing teams or wrestling events are any more effective at bringing in military recruits, yet the Department of Defense spends tens of millions of dollars every year to sponsor them. Now, I respect the patriotism and the passion of motorsports fans, and everyone knows the special tradition that Minnesota has in my home state of fishing. In fact, I'll be purchasing another fishing license myself again this weekend but we are wasting precious tax dollars. I would ask the committee, in light of what we just passed with Mr. Mr. Flakes, I'm not banning this, but we, I'm unable to get hard, hard numbers, hard counts, any more than I've got in recruitment than what I've been able to share with you after months and months and months of requests. We need to know what's going on with this. Um, our taxpayers deserve to know that we take all of our oversight responsibility seriously well, and not just worry about a comfort factor. Yes, I yield. Yeah, you used the figure $7.4 billion. Uh, 7.4 million, excuse me. Okay. If I, I just wanted to give you a chance thank you. to correct it. Thank you very much. I appreciate the ranking member looking out for me. <laughs> Chairman Lewis. I always do my best. Uh, Chairman Young, sorry. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, we were advised of this amendment sometime uh, in advance and had an opportunity to look at it closely. Uh, and we're not going to support this amendment. Uh, the uh, military spends a lot of money recruiting. And that's why we don't have to resort to a draft. Because we have an all-volunteer service. Recruiting is very successful. This is just one of the ways that the military uh, gets, to the, gets to the potential recruits. And the Army and the National Guard and the Air Force have given us numbers that are pretty impressive on how many, how many recruiting leads that they open because of NASCAR events. Now, if you've ever been to a NASCAR event, uh, when the national anthem is played, the, the crowd goes wild. They're very, very patriotic people that attend NASCAR. Uh, this is not a good amendment because it will cut into a very effective way to, to recruit. Now, we could take this money and spend it on newspaper ads or television ads, but we'd get three newspaper stories because of these sporting events and NASCAR events. We'd get three television coverage because of these sporting events and these NASCAR events that millions and millions and millions of people watch NASCAR and go to NASCAR. And I know that because we have a large NASCAR facility in Florida called Daytona. And, uh, <laughs> but uh, I, I understand the gentlelady's concern here, and I have the privilege of serving on the Military Construction VA subcommittee with Chairman Culbertson, uh, and I was there for the markup uh, when the same amendment was offered, but now that's different. That amendment, we did not disagree with that amendment, because it was different. It, that was money, a limitation for a one-time one race event. That is not the case when you're dealing with NASCAR. These National Guard drivers, and I've had a chance to, to meet with them, they have come to visit me in the office uh, because they're so proud of their relationship to the military. And we made contacts with them, for them, with the military. Uh, they're really excited about part taking part in a recruiting for America, for America's military. I just think we make a big mistake by eliminating one of the more effective and productive forms of recruiting. So I'm not reluctant to oppose this amendment. I am uh, enthusiastic about opposing this amendment. <laughs> Mr. Bishop. I, I reluctantly have to part company with my 
colleague on this amendment uh, because I think that uh, perhaps she does not understand the cultural uh, relationship of NASCAR to those of us who hail from the South. I think all of our <laughs> southern states uh, have as a part of our culture uh, racing. But if you look at the support uh, personnel of our military, for our aircraft, for our vehicles, uh, we have so many mechanics that support uh, the weapon systems that our military has. And of course, uh, where better than, than people who tinker with automobiles, youngsters who grew up tinkering with automobiles, uh, can they get the exposure uh, and get the, the seeds planted uh, to hone those skills in the military? And I think that uh, the, the ad advertising with NASCAR, uh, both for our veterans as well as for potential recruits of our military is, is a dollar's well spent. Uh, and I would, I would hope that uh, we would allow that to, uh, to continue and would not put a damper on that. Uh, the Secretary of Veterans Affairs in that one event wanted to highlight um, with regard to veterans the benefits for the new GI Bill for Iraq and Afghanistan veterans. And of course, in a memorial uh, to the 9-11 sponsored a race to which uh, I think Ms. Ms. McCollum referred. Um, but colleges and universities uh, attested that many of the veterans who were in attendance or who wanted to attend those colleges were unaware of the educational benefits that were available to them through this new uh, GI Bill to them and their families. And as a consequence, uh, because of this NASCAR advertising, which reaches hundreds of thousands of people uh, every weekend, uh, I think is, 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 is money well spent and that we ought to be very, very careful uh, when we want to limit that because we do have an all-volunteer force and we don't want to have to get to the point of a draft. Mr. Dix. With the well, I'll, I'll just take my own time. Uh, Mr. Chairman, can I ask you a question on this? Sure. <coughs> yes, sir. I think I, this, this subject has come up repeatedly. It might be of some, some value to have a briefing to bring over the people from the Army and the National Guard sure. and really go through this so we get both sides of the story. Uh, and I, I reluctantly uh, disagree with my colleague from Minnesota and support the committee's position on this. Uh, I think we don't know enough yet to make this decision. Well, I would respond to the gentleman since that was sort of a question. Yeah. Uh, I, th I think that's a good idea and we'll pursue that. Yeah. It was sort of a question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Fattah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I, what I think is important here is that if the purpose is recruiting, then we need to get down to the empirical quantitative reality about whether or not the money spent is recruiting people. Because there are a lot of young people uh, from a, a place like Philadelphia who may not have the benefit of uh, understanding, as uh, my colleague Mr. Bishop says, uh, the culture in the South, but they have understood their patriotic duty and have volunteered in, uh, in our military and in uh, very, uh, very high numbers. We need to be recruiting young people from where we're getting them from, and we need to be relevant in their lives in terms of the activities that they may be involved in. So, you know, NASCAR might be great, but, you know, a, a college basketball tournament uh, among uh, a certain groups of colleges might also be a great place. I think we need to get to what works and not be hung up in our own predispositions about this. So I think a briefing would be great. And I think actually learning more about how to connect up with these young people and, uh, and, and their desires so that we can always have this great all volunteer force that we have. But if we're spending $600,000 at an event by the National Guard and coming up with zero recruits, it sounds more like it's uh, someone's notion of what should be done versus the reality of what should be done. The gentleman yield. Would the gentleman yield? Mr. Patai. I will always yield to my chairman. What would you think about uh, the military sponsoring a 
basketball game between Temple and University of Kentucky. Oh, just and Mr. Chairman, I might even be willing to let Kentucky get close to winning if we can work something out. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Your further discussion. He's spoken his last words. <laughs> uh, if not, the gentlelady is recognized for one minute. Thank you, and thank you for, I mean, it was, it was a lighthearted banner, and I know there's a lot of passion around this, but we have to get down to the numbers. Because when I have gotten numbers, the return on our tax dollar has not proved that this has been valuable recruiting. The Marine Corps, the Marine Corps does not do this. The Marine Corps has always been all volunteer folks, and we know that uh, the, the reputation that, that the Marine Corps has for taking some of the hardest hits, along with many of our other airmen, airwomen, and people who serve uh, valiantly in the Army and the Navy and the rest. But the Marine Corps does not do this. So not all of our military branches sees, sees this as valuable. And you know, I'm from Minnesota, I fish, walleye and bass fishing teams. I mean, we need to, we need to know what's going on in here. So I really appreciate uh, the, the, both, both the chairman and the ranking member saying we need to figure out what's working and what's not working and not just take people's passion points for this because uh, th th this, is, this is important that we attract the best and the brightest from all around <coughs> the country to service in our military. So I thank the chairman for your indulgence. Time for debate has expired. All in favor of the amendment say aye. 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 Opposed nay. No. The noes appear to have it. The noes have it, and the amendment is not agreed to. Before we wind up here, let me let the chair say this. Uh, I'm really proud of this committee. You're working through the bills in a very orderly and, and expeditious fashion. The debate in here is uh, high level. Uh, it is uh, bipartisan. Uh, I'm really proud of your work so far this year. We've got a ways to go yet. But uh, you're turning out the bills on time, and you're participating in the debate on the floor in a, in a great way. So just a word of uh, compliments to you. I think you're doing great. Are, yeah. <laughs> Are there further amendments? Hearing none, gentlemen from California, Mr. Lewis is recognized. Mr. Chairman. I move to favorably report the bill making appropriations for the Department of Defense for fiscal year 2012 to the House. You have heard the motion. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed no. The ayes have it. And it is so ordered. Three days for the gentleman as requested. I ask unanimous consent that the staff be given the authority to make technical and conforming changes to the items approved today. Without objection, so ordered. No further business. Committee stands adjourned. Good work. Are you, are you rest are you rested up? We were